In the first part of this week's lecture, I will be discussing psychological research, continuing the content from Chapter 1. For the second part, I will be discussing neuroscience and behavior from Chapter 2. First off, let's define research. For purposes of this course, research is defined as the systematic inquiry aimed at the discovery of new knowledge. Why is this important? Well, humans are curious creatures, and the world is a fascinating place. Why do people remember events that never happened to them? It's a good question that has been studied extensively by researchers. Conducting research is a significant way to understand and make sense of the world around us. The importance of doing that in a systematic way gives credence to the results, as I hope you will discover in working on your own research for this class. One way to conduct research is by using the scientific method. Where the definition of research was the systematic inquiry aimed at the discovery of new knowledge, the scientific method is the systematic acquisition of that knowledge, the ways we go about getting the knowledge and understanding about a particular research area. For psychology, it's about understanding humans, and we can also include animals here as well, and their behaviors. There are four main steps to the scientific method. We start with identifying a question of interest. What do you want to know about? This will be important when finding a topic for your research paper. Next comes formulating an explanation. What do you believe about your topic? Do you have a theory about why something is so? For example, you might have an idea about the connection between cell phones and driving, so that as cell phone usage increases, driving reaction times might decrease. In the next step, you would design a methodology in carrying out your research. For the cell phone and driving example, you might conduct a survey to look at accidents while texting or talking on a cell phone. In the final step, you would take your findings and let the world know about them. For this class, you will be sharing your knowledge with the rest of the class during your presentations. Now let's briefly take a look at some research methods. First off, naturalistic observation. This means observing what you want to study in a natural habitat. An example is Jane Goodall studying chimpanzees where they live in Tanzania in East Africa. Another method is laboratory observation. There are many studies conducted in a lab environment in an attempt to artificially create a situation that can be studied. The Milgram experiment is a good example of a controlled experiment conducted in the lab to study obedience to authority and if people would commit acts that were in conflict with their conscience and their values. Research participants were instructed to administer an electrical shock to another volunteer if they pronounced a word incorrectly. The volunteer getting shocked was in a separate room and was actually acting as part of the experiment. The researcher would instruct the participant to increase the electrical shock and the actor would cry out in pain. Some participants continued to follow orders and others did not. An interesting but controversial study. Case studies are another research method, and this entails analyzing a particular individual, or a group, or even an event. An example of this might be interviewing the surviving firefighters from 9-11 Twin Towers attack and see what impact that event had on their lives. The last method I'll discuss here are surveys and polls. Researchers gather information from a particular population using questionnaires or interviews, for example, cigarette smokers and depression. You may have been part of a survey or a poll at least once in your life. They are used quite a bit in psychology, as well as marketing and politics. Let's move on now to neuroscience and behavior. So why is it important to study the brain and the nervous system in psychology? We can learn a lot about how we feel, act, and think based on biological factors. Take emotions, for example. The experience of emotions, while seemingly complex when we are experiencing them, are part of physical processes in the brain due to neuronal activity. Neurotransmitter functioning affects us in many ways, including diseases and major mental illness. For example, low levels of dopamine have been linked to diseases like Parkinson's and depression, and high levels of dopamine have been linked to schizophrenia. I'll explain more about neurotransmitters in a moment. Studying biological factors has also led to insight and understanding about the brain and psychological disorders. One famous example is the case of Phineas Gage. He was working on the railroad when an explosion propelled an iron rod through his skull, passing through his left cheek and out through the top of his head, passing right through his brain. The iron rod was no small item either. It was over three and a half feet long with a circumference of one and a quarter inches. By January of the next year, 
He seemed recovered and his life appeared normal. However, reports from individuals who knew him stated that he was undergoing a dramatic change in personality. His prefrontal cortex had been damaged, which led to a loss of reasoning and social inhibition, resulting in no checks and balances on his behavior. I'll talk more about the prefrontal cortex a little bit later in this video. Given the unusual nature of this event, his case provided information about the brain that may have taken years to understand otherwise. We certainly know more about the brain now than we did then, but there is still a lot more to learn. Let's take a look now at some of the basic elements of the nervous system. Keep in mind that this is not a biology class, so we will not be going in depth, but I do want to emphasize some major biological processes that affect our cognitive, emotional, and behavioral functioning. First off, the brain is made up of neurons, trillions of neurons, which are nerve cells that are the basic building block of the nervous system. Their specific function is to transmit information throughout the entire body. They communicate through electrical and chemical means. The basic structure of the neuron is comprised of four major components. The dendrites, which receive messages from other neurons, the axon, which carries messages down its length to other neurons, the terminal buttons, which sends messages to other neurons, and the other neurons receive them from their dendrites, and the myelin sheath, which is a coating of fat and protein that protects the cell. When that protective sheath gets compromised or damaged, diseases like MS can occur. What happens when there is a meeting of neurons? Transmission of information occurs via the synapse which is a gap between the dendrites of adjoining neurons. As you can see in this picture, neurotransmitters are being released from one cell and being taken up by the other. This is a simple representation of a complex process, but it can give you a good sense of the general idea. So what are these neurotransmitters? They are chemicals that get carried across the synapse from one neuron to the receptor site of another neuron, getting absorbed into that adjoining neuron. Neurotransmitters are an essential part of our everyday functioning. For example, acetylcholine is vital to memory, muscle contractions, and learning, and low levels of this neurotransmitter have been linked to Alzheimer's disease. Now let's take a look at the nervous system. We've been discussing the importance of neurons, which involve a network of neurons that allow communication to occur between the brain and the body. These organized network of neurons make up the nervous system. There are two parts the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. We'll start with the central nervous system. To begin with, the central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord, which is essential to life and functioning as we know it. They are the center of the body's communication system. They process all the sensory information that comes into the organism we know as us. That's a lot of information. The central nervous system also sends out messages to the body in order to control actions in response to environmental conditions. Cold outside? Your central nervous system processes this information and then informs you to put on a coat to keep warm. The peripheral nervous system is made up of nerve and nerve networks that extend outside the central nervous system into the whole body. The peripheral nervous system is divided into two systems, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is responsible for voluntary movements and actions. So imagine getting up from your chair to get something to eat that would be voluntary. The autonomic nervous system is responsible for the control of involuntary functions like breathing and digestion. Using the cold outside example again, the autonomic nervous system would let you know you were cold by shivering. Most of the time we don't even think about these, especially if they're working fine. Now the autonomic nervous system is further divided into two branches, the sympathetic branch and the parasympathetic branch. When the sympathetic branch gets activated, it's usually in response to some kind of threat that the body processes as an emergency. Heart rate increases, pupils dilate, digestion slows or stops. Resources are used to either fight or flee from the situation. A third type is freeze, and I'll be discussing that later when we talk about psychological disorders. The function of the parasympathetic branch is to calm us after the crisis or danger has passed. To remember the difference between the two, you can think of the parasympathetic branch as a parachute coming down, para, hence parachute, calming the body after an exciting jump out of a plane. Next up is the endocrine system. 
Although it is not part of the nervous system, it is still essential for communication throughout the body. The endocrine system is comprised of glands that secrete hormones, which are chemical messengers similar to neurotransmitters. Hormones move through the bloodstream, providing information to organs and body tissues. Hormones affect the body in a wide range of ways. They regulate our metabolism, control our reproductive cycle, induce hunger and cravings, and can cause mood swings. When there's an imbalance with hormone functioning, it can cause some serious problems. An example of a hormone is oxycotin, which provides satisfaction and pleasure. Imagine if there's a low level and what that might do to your mood. Can you see how vital a normal functioning endocrine system might be for psychological functioning? We'll be looking at a few of the glands vital to endocrine functioning. The hypothalamus is a gland that can be considered communication central. It is the link between the central nervous system and the endocrine system, and it is essential for communication of the two systems. The hypothalamus regulates a huge amount of behavior like sleep, hunger, thirst, and stress. It also regulates the pituitary gland, which controls the release of hormones from other glands in the endocrine system. The pituitary, considered the master gland, is vital to functioning because it directs other organs to either secrete or suppress hormone production. The pituitary gland controls the production and release of hormones that act on muscles, growth hormone, ovaries and testes, and the adrenals. If your pituitary is not functioning normally, it may cause problems in these and other areas. Let's take a look at the thyroid. The thyroid controls our metabolism. So when the thyroid stimulating hormone is not in balance, that could throw off your whole body's metabolism, which includes growth, energy, and balance. You may know someone who has too much or too little thyroid activity and see how it affects their activity levels. Too much, hyperactive, too little, lethargic. That can have a major impact on psychological well-being. We're moving now into looking at the brain. I'm going to go through this slide pretty quickly just to point out a few basic brain processes. This slide is to give you a general idea of the structure of the brain and where certain processes are located. So for this particular slide, we're looking at what's called the central core, or what is known as our old brain. You can see that most of the processes here are located near the brain stem. So let's start with the medulla. The medulla is responsible for breathing and our heartbeat. And the pons, which you can see down there by the brain stem near the medulla, is responsible for sleep and respiration. Next is the cerebellum down there on the bottom right which is responsible for motor coordination and balance, how we move through space and time, reaching and sitting, and how well we do that. Uh, next is the reticular formation, which is responsible for our general bodily arousal and our walking. Uh, the next is the thalamus, which is the uh, integration of information and also relay, relays information. So you can think of it as a, sort of like a grand central station of the brain. And the next is uh, the hypothalamus, which we talked about a little bit uh, earlier. And that is responsible for maintaining homeostasis, which, which means it's just creating a balance within the body. So you can think of it as being not too hot and not too cold, but just right. And you can see here we've been in the middle of the brain um, what we were just talking about with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. You can see they're, they're small, uh, they're small glands, uh, but they are responsible for a lot. So very important uh, glands. Let's move now into looking at the limbic system. It's a fascinating part of our brain functioning. It is responsible for emotions, drives, memory, learning, and our sense of smell. The amygdala is specifically responsible for emotion and aggression. It is a small mass of nuclei that has some major impact, like emotional learning, consolidating information into long-term memory, and playing a role in the flight or fight response. The next time you get cut off by another driver and have an immediate aggressive response, you can thank your amygdala. If their prefrontal cortex doesn't kick in soon enough, 
you might end up doing something you'll regret. The hippocampus is also important in that it is involved in the formation of new memories and with learning and emotions. If there is damage to the hippocampus, this can result in memory loss. Learning and memory are inextricably linked, and we'll be talking about that more when we get to those chapters. The cerebral cortex is part of the new brain that gives humans the capacity for higher thought, language, self-reflection, human consciousness, reasoning and evaluating, making judgments, and imagination. There are four major lobes, including the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. The frontal lobe is associated with reasoning, motor skills, higher level thinking, and expressive language. Damage to this area can increase one's risk-taking behavior. Making poor decisions would definitely fall into this category. The parietal is associated with processing sensory information like pressure, touch, and pain. The temporal lobe is associated with interpreting sounds and language. Since the hippocampus is located in the temporal lobe, damage to this area can cause problems with memory as well. The occipital lobe is associated with interpreting visual information, and damage to this area can cause visual problems like having difficulty recognizing objects and trouble recognizing words. Our brain has an amazing capacity to reorganize itself, which is known as neuroplasticity. It allows the neurons to compensate for injury and disease and to adjust their activities in response to new situations or to changes in the environment. For example, individuals who have suffered a stroke and have lost functioning in some brain areas found that their brain had rewired some circuits around the damaged area and found a way to continue their functioning. Pretty incredible. I'll finish up this lecture talking about the right brain, left brain phenomenon. The left hemisphere is responsible for language and rational thought and receives information from the right side of the body. The right hemisphere is associated with nonverbal information like perception, emotion, and visual recognition. The right hemisphere receives information from the left side of the body. They are not distinct and separate from each other, but are in communication via the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is a band that connects the two hemispheres together so that they can communicate. An interesting study found that those who engaged in musical activities, playing an instrument for example, had a thicker corpus callosum and therefore more communication between the two hemispheres, having a balance of being artistic and rational has its benefits. You can see from all the information covered here that biological functioning has a major contribution to psychological functioning, which we will continue to explore as we get further into the course. Okay, that's it for now.